Okay, so now we're in chapter three. Uh, the last thing we saw at the end of chapter two was they were naked and unashamed. Okay, so when God makes... The, the point is, is God has rested from all his work. Everything is good. There was one thing that wasn't good was that Adam was alone. And so there's this woman created from his side. And now the idea is that everything is good. And they were both naked and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Uh, now, nakedness, I mean, yes, they were naked, but... I really believe it means to be able to stand scrutiny. That there's nothing hidden, there's nothing covered, fully transparent. You're not wearing a mask, you're not changing your behavior, you're not trying to uh, manage anyone's perception of you. You know, the reason we wear clothing is to cover ourselves and, to, and we pick clothes that Except, you know, I mean, some of us do. I mean, not, not all of us. Like, I don't really have any skills in wearing, in, in fashion. But, you know, fashion is all about managing your appearance, which is a kind of manipulation. Uh, you are adding things to what God created, which was good. You know, they were, they were created good and naked and unashamed, meaning just as they are is good what they are is good there's no shame in it and they can not only that but they can stand the scrutiny of god himself without the feeling of a need to hide or cover themselves and that means they're real with each other too that's what how i look at nakedness nakedness is i'm real you know i'm not covering i'm not managing perception okay so, against that backdrop, we have the serpent, who is more subtle than any beast of the field. And what is subtlety? Subtlety is all about managing people's perceptions of things. It's a kind of sorcery. Subtlety means uh, the devil is in the details. You know, managing details of things to navigate situations and get people to bend to your will and turn things to your advantage. So subtlety, in a way, is opposite of nakedness. Nakedness is, I don't have a hidden agenda. What you see is what you get. But the enemy is full of subtlety, the serpent here. Now we know that the serpent is that old serpent, the devil, referenced in Genesis, I'm, I'm sorry, in Revelation twice, John calls him that old serpent, the devil. It's Satan. Um, so this is not just a snake. Uh, you know, so, so some unbelievers go, see, this is all silliness because there's a snake talking in the garden. No, this is a cherub. This is a fallen cherub who I believe probably we there were this, there, there were cherubim that guard the glory of God and surround God and are his perpetual witnesses. And not only are they the witnesses to God's glory, but they're the witnesses also to God's holiness and, vindic and his righteousness on display in the blood of Jesus Christ. Because remember, the Ark of the Covenant was surrounded by the cherubim and that, that is the, a throne of sorry i'm very tired a picture of the throne of god and i'm very tired because i have sleep issues and i'm going to go see a doctor next week about it just so you know because i say i'm tired a lot well there's a there's an issue going on anyway the throne of god uh one aspect is the ark of the covenant right and the uh the blood on the mercy seat and the cherubim looking down at the blood and according to that is the according to uh, Romans three, that is a picture of Christ being witnessed by the law and the prophets and the angels in the heavens as a demonstration of God's righteousness. He is God's righteousness in the propitiation. That is God's holiness and righteousness on display in His dealing with us. And the the cherubim are called to witness that. 
even Satan. Uh, eventually he is cast down, but he is there accusing night and day. He's still in that kind of position of being grouped in there, getting close enough to God that he can make accusations against us. And Christ is being put on display as God's righteousness is being vindicated in dealing with us. So it's just kind of interesting who this guy, who this serpent is. He was a cherubim, and I believe that you know there's four cherubim that we know of that have a face of an ox, an eagle, a man, and a lion, right? And these winged creatures uh, that are incredible. There's lightning going up and down their bodies. They're very large. They have wings. They have eyes within and all around, and they are the closest thing to the glory of God besides the church. The church is brought even closer ultimately. But the anointed cherub that covered was Lucifer. That was a fifth cherub. And I believe he had a dragon, uh, the face of a dragon. Maybe. I don't know. He was beautiful. He was the, sum, he was the most beautiful thing in God's creation. He was super wise, super intelligent. And um, we know he fell at some point. He's already fallen here. So now he's approaching subtly Eve, the woman, who is up until this point naked and un unashamed, guileless, transparent. Guileless is another word. You know, uh, the disciples when Jesus was calling the disciples and Nathaniel came uh, I think Andrew told uh, Nathaniel come see him who the law and the prophets have written about Jesus of Nazareth we found him he's like can nothing can anything good come out of Nazareth and Jesus said behold an Israelite indeed in who there's no guile you know, it means your opinions are your opinions and you just are what you are and you're not second guessing what you are and you're not trying to manage what you are and control what you are and handle yourself. And, you know, you just say what's on your mind, right or wrong, right? That's Nathaniel in whom there's no guile. And here's the serpent coming to the guileless woman full of subtlety. And this is a cherub. Uh, who I believe would have been manifested as an angel of light in glory, would have been beautiful looking. And it's interesting that he just talks to her and she talks to him without any sign of fear. You know, the again, the pre-fall condition of Adam and Eve was glorious. Um, they could stand in the presence of angels and in the presence of God unashamed. Uh, okay, so the serpent was more... Uh, Subtle than any beast of the field which God had made, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? See, now that is subtle. He's, in this exchange, he says very little. And yet, what he said messed up the destiny, you know, messed up everything. The enemy does not have to say much to get you all turned around. Um, I think a lot of times we think, oh, the enemy's really attacking me. No, most of it is us. He may have whispered one thing, but it's what we it's what we take and run with that's the problem. And he is a master of psychology. He knows how to trip us up and get us second-guessing ourselves and our understanding first, and then really bring us into a place of defeat. And so he says, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now he, God had said, you can freely eat of all the trees of the garden. You freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat. So there was only one tree that they weren't supposed to eat. Um, but the way he framed it was, First of all, he questioned whether or not everything was freely given and pointed out this one restriction. And, you know, there's only one restriction in the whole place. Uh, they've got everything. 
And yet the enemy, through this one question, brings the attention to the only restrictive thing there is, which shouldn't have been that attractive, you know? But that shows the nature of what the enemy likes to do. Um, and the woman said, we, sh we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she says, look, no, we're allowed to do everything, you know? This, is, this isn't a restrictive situation. Everything is available to us. But of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good, uh, I'm sorry, fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God says, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now she's added in her defense of what God has said. So we know she added a word, which is you shall not touch it. It's really interesting. So God had said you shall not eat it, but he didn't say you shall not touch it. So because the, it was restrictive, uh, it was assumed to be more restrictive than it actually was, which is a problem with the, you know, that is a problem with the way we interpret things. That's a, the begin, That's legalism right there. You add something to the mix. It's like she made a Talmud out of God's law. You know, the, the, the law said you shall rest on the seventh day, and the Talmud said, and if you walk more than 30, 30 uh, centimeters, you're going to be put to death because that's work, you know? In other words, you start, okay, well, what are the boundaries of this thing? And you start adding conditions to make sure you're safe from it. Um, and that's what this is. But once he knew, see, he baited her with asking her a question to get her to respond. And that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to bait you. I see it on my wall all the time. People will ask me a leading question, and I know they're baiting me. And if they can get me to respond, they can get me engaging them and try to get me in the flesh, you know. That's what the enemy really wants to do is get you in the flesh. <laughs> um, and the woman said, okay, she added a condition. Once he knew that, once he knew that she was not clear about the word. Now, that remember, the word was given to her through Adam because she wasn't there when God said it. He said that before he created the woman. Uh, so she's got secondhand information of what God said, and she's added a condition. I don't know if Adam added it or she did. So the enemy, realizing that she's ignorant, capitalized on that and jumped in. He said, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat of it, uh, your eyes will be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's all the enemy said. It's not a lot, but it's enough. You know, he got, he baited her. He, with a kind of a diversionary tactic to get her to defend See, that's <laughs> the enemy wants you to get in on the defensive, and she was on the defensive with with the question he asked: Does God said you you know can't eat of everything? And she's like, No, everything's free. It's just the one in the middle of the garden. We're not allowed to touch it. Once he saw that, he he knew he had her, and so he just immediately injected. But he'd already got her on the defensive about God's character. Which means that there's a question already about God's character. Is everything freely given to you? You know, do you really have everything you need? Um, so then he tells her, you know, God knows. He See, he's lying to you. God knows that the day you eat of it, you're going to be as gods. Your eyes will be opened. And you'll know good and evil. Um now, that knowledge that he promised her, I just always picture the kundalini serpent force uh, in the mystical religions like Hinduism where they'll show a picture of a guy and he's got this serpent inside of him that goes through his seven different chakra, which are different points of light in his body, and then come out his third eye as a... It's like the dragon... The serpent's mouth comes out his eye as light... And now he's illuminated and enlightened. This is deeper than what we really understand. It is a promise of mystical power. It's a promise of deity. Uh, the enemy was telling her that she could be like God. Now she's already been created in the image of God. 
and she gets to walk with God, and she has dominion over everything, including this creature, if she'd have known. You know, she, uh, the enemy can't really do anything unless he can deceive you. That's what he can do, is he can get you all turned around in your mind, and that's what he did. Um, so then she saw, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And that is three things that I believe correspond to First John, the world. What makes up the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is that it's good for food. The lust of the eyes is pleasant to the eyes, you know. And then the pride of life is the desire to be wise. And that's the root motive here, is the pride of life that the enemy seduced with. Um, and remember, this is the enemy tempted, the serpent tempted Eve. And Paul said, I'm afraid that like the uh, serpent tempted Eve, you may be seduced from the simplicity in the gospel uh, unto an, either another gospel or another spirit or another Jesus. And so the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a replacement for the things that they already had in Christ that were available to them, represented by the tree of life, actually. It's a substitute offered by the subtlety of the enemy that corrupted her mind and deceived her and led her away, got her attention off the good things she had, got her attention onto the one thing she supposedly didn't have, lied about what God said, got her to second guess what God said, second guess her own understanding of her situation, right? And then offered her this alternative. And so she took it and it says, gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Now the Bible says that Adam was not deceived. Paul says that. It was the woman that was deceived, not Adam. So Adam partook of it with her. And in this, again, I believe he's a type of Christ. On the one hand, he really did it, and it was a sin. On the other hand, Christ became sin for us. He took the punishment. He identified himself with us, which he didn't have to do. Adam could have stood alone and just let her fall, you know. But he entered into the situation with her. And that ultimately is provided the way for man's redemption because it's through their coupling that the seed would eventually be produced, right? Well, the, 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 the bloodline would continue. The genealogy and the blessing and the dominion would continue, if that makes sense. Uh, and the eyes of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig, trees, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, so they were... Now they know they're naked. Now that's interesting. And then they, what did they seek to do? They sought to cover themselves. Was there a problem with them being naked? No. Now there's guile. Now the subtlety is in their character. Now they've got a self-consciousness and a shame that's the base of their interactions with God and everything. And that is, by the way, the fallen human personality is put together from shame. I believe our personality, for the most part, before we get saved, is, is made up largely of defense mechanisms that we use to navigate in this world and cover our nakedness so that we're not guileless, we're not transparent, you know. Very few are. And what God wants to do once we are saved is to start taking those layers off uh, and reducing us to where we can stand in his presence again without this tendency to hide. And he does that through perfecting our conscience. But this is a problem of their conscience. They've got a warped conscience where they think that what God has created and is good is something to be ashamed of, which is themselves. They're ashamed of themselves. And so they sew fig leaves together and make themselves aprons. Now, the word apron there is interesting because if you search it out in the scriptures, the Hebrew word, and I can't do it because I've got my internet connection turned off right now, it's almost always translated armor, as in war. It's a girdle for war. Uh, 
which is interesting because they know they're not they, this is an, an outright rebellion um and they're prepared to have to fight uh you know at babel the tower of babel was made uh to ascend into heaven and josephus said that their plan was they were going to storm the heavens and cast God off his throne and put their idols in its place. And we know that at the end in the book of Revelation, the armies of the world actually try to knock the lamb out of the sky with their weapons. So man has been at war with God ever since this. This is the beginning of the fall. And we know that Colossians says that the fallen mind is at enmity with God, alienated through wicked works. It's carnal, it's hostile to God. It can't be subject to him. It's full of wrath towards God. And it, it's a blaspheming mind, full of accusations towards God. The atheistic mind or the mind that rejects God is full of accusations towards God. Um, they are changed at this point. Definitely. Uh, they're ready to go to war. They're at odds. So there's just so much more to this story than we realize, you know. But they're also covering their nakedness in shame and fear. And that's a whole new thing. Um, okay, I am so tired. I'm going to take a break. I'm just going to put this one up as a single message and I'll come back to it. I'll keep these short. I'm probably going to have to take a little nap. <laughs> Talk to you later.